Hello, and welcome to this webinar, Tunnel Deformation During Excavation and Operation, Monitoring for Safety and Sustainability. My name is Jane Rousel. It's my pleasure to moderate this afternoon's session. Now, our objective today is to provide three reasons to consider using fiber optic sensing on your project. We're going to start this afternoon with Niels Noether, who is CEO of Fibris Terra in Berlin, Germany. And follow, uh, following Niels will be Christoph Monsberger from ACI Monitoring, based in Graz, Austria. Niels will start by describing distributed fiber optic sensing and sharing with us a bench demo of the, of the system. And Christoph will then follow and show how the system is used in the field with some case studies and results. So on that note, Niels, can I hand over to you? Well, thank you so much, Jane, and um, thank you everybody for being on. I shall go back to my slides now. The core concept of what we're talking about here is, well, often referred to as the big word smart structures. What's that? Um, the idea of a smart structure is um, coming into, into life where a, a, structural, a, a structural or geotechnical project uh, during construction operation reports on its own from its very inside about condition, production load, safety, health, long-term behavior, fatigue. Um, it is the idea that a smart structure helps the operator or people that are responsible for um, ensuring safe operation or risk management to know not only from the outside, but from the very inside what's going on. So that um, idea of bringing sensors into a structure is not exactly new. <clears throat> um, conventionally, um, discrete or point-wise sensors would be placed along a building, a structure, as a construction, um, individually placed, individually wired, maybe wireless, still reporting from dedicated points previously elected to be of interest. Um, from that, we have an evolution towards fiber optic sensing, first materialized in the concept of quasi-distributed sensors or known to with the by the technology uh, of fiber break rating sensing FPG, where an optical fiber becomes a sensor along which a series or a chain of sensors are lined up. So benefit, benefiting from the characteristics of, of fiber optic sensing, like being immune to electromagnetic fields or lightning puncture being not individually wired, but just um, accessible from, from one end, chemical inert and all that. Still, um, with the limitation that previous knowledge about where a structure might deliver data of interest is required because you place the sensors point-wise still. From that, we come to the truly distributed sensors. And that is fiber optic sensing um, as we would like to present it today. Again, an optical fiber as used for telecommunication mostly becomes a sensor, but this time an uninterrupted one, spatially continuous, every position along the fiber contributes to the data that we get. The specific technology that we're talking about is uh, distributed strain and temperature sensing, we refer to it by, well, by its abbreviation DTSS, or often by its um, physical name, distributed brillant sensing. Uh, and that means that the fiber that becomes the sensor delivers uninterrupted data, spatially continuous monitor as often and as long as you want in 24 seven operation or plugging in, coming back a month later and referring to the baseline. 
In our concrete case, this is what we call the interrogator unit for industry assignments relied, um, designed for robustness and reliability in the field. It is measuring distributed fiber optic sensing in two flavors or in two operational modes. One is the high resolution and high performance BOFDA, that's the loop configuration. That means the optical fiber, that's the sensors, is connected with both ends to the interrogated unit, as you see there in the picture, and you will see uh, on my desk right away. Um, going down to a spatial resolution, so that's the smallest strain or temperature event that can be correctly resolved goes down to 50 centimeters in standard operation, even down to 20 centimeters at measurement length up to, uh, to two kilometers, and um, offers fiber optic sensing lengths, loop lengths up to 50 kilometers and even beyond. Accuracy values are way below uh, one degree C or um, 10 micrometer per meter strain or micro strain. That is the loop configuration. There's another operation mode that we proudly introduced a few years ago, also patented technology of our own, which is the BOFDR mode, uh, which allows for measurements even only with one um, end of the fiber being accessible. So that would mean that uh, only one end of the fiber, which is the sensor, is connected to the interrogator unit. With that, very handy in true projects, still delivering valid data if the fiber breaks for some reason, or if even in the first place during the project design stage, only one fiber end is accessible. With limited performance, limited spatial resolution, that's just physics. Um, nevertheless, delivering reliable data also from one fiber end. From here, I would directly switch on to my uh, test bench that I've just set up. For that, I switch my camera and you should see um, exactly that, what you see on the slides as well, which is the FTB 5020 interrogator unit. Um, it's a 19 inch rack case. It's designed for fuel reliability. Uh, we managed to bring the power consumption down to as low as 30 watts, which is extremely interesting because that also allowed us to have a fully sealed uh, rack case, no openings, no fans, no dust coming in, uh, low temperature, low, uh, low power consumption means also um, reliable temperature range from zero to 45 degrees, 30 watts power consumption, seven kilo weight. Um, so that's sitting here and connected to that, there is a fiber loop, as I said, a fiber optic sensing cable. I will uh, talk with a few more words about what that means. Um, fixed to a strain test bench, which is over here. So um, on that, I've simply clamped a fiber optic sensing cable. A bit untypical, it has uh, four fibers inside. Um, but that's interesting because you can imagine the four fibers adjust together in parallel, tightly fixed in inside this um, fiber optic sensing cable. And we've chosen an arrangement in which all the fibers, all the four fibers are connected together back and forth to one long loop, actually, with all the four fibers being in parallel and being strained. So this is a setup, um, which of course requires a user interface. And that you, the user interface I will show right here. And this is our proprietary software, which comes along with, just need to find it on my screen, there it is. Um, which comes along with every, uh, well, it, it, it's just an integral part of the interrogator unit. So it comes with the interrogate unit. That's the user interface for a distributed strain measurement. Um, setting up the measurement is done within a few clicks. Uh, I will just quickly walk through 
the uh, well, spatial resolution settings and fiber length and all that is going in here. From here, we come to the monitoring configuration where I say, I want to make a series of measurements, which I shall call demo 01. Didn't think of anything better than that. And let's start. So what's actually happening in here is that the uh, interrogator unit now performs a sweep along the optical fiber, uh, analyzes what we call the resonance of the Brillant backscattering. That's the physics that is linearly dependent on strain and temperature. Maybe I change the color of that with, to make it more, make it better process. So yeah, I think two of that are enough for now. Oh, we have some initial strain on that cable. It's uh, not untypical. It's a, a type of a cable where the fiber is, is tight and so the cable is wound up. So it goes back and forth for a few microstrain or micrometer per meter. Interesting part comes now. I will turn this micrometer screw. And Jake, just take another reading. Let's start here, and then we'll see. So, and that is what a distributed strain measurement on those just barely 50 meters of um, of optical fiber looks like. As I said, we have the four fibers and consequently we see four sections of strain off. We had it quite precisely 0.5 meters, 50 centimeters. So that is nice, of course, um, in a real project. Well, many implications for real projects here, but let's, let me just point out the, 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 the fact that um, in a real project, initial strain is not really of importance. So all these uh, waves going up and down for all the readings uh, shall be eliminated. For that, I simply pick the first one as a reference iteration, as our baseline, so to speak. Um, go to relative strain, and then we see that exactly the everything is like reference to the baseline iteration. And we have the um, four sections of roughly, no, of exa uh, precisely half a meter. Um, so that is pretty straightforward. There are many things still to that user interface that makes make lives, lives easier. Um, also views of the of the raw data of the Brillant frequency shift. So from here you could see, you don't see fortunately, but you could see if there's a, a dirty connector or that splice that, you, that would uh, require cleaning or redoing. Um, if all the parameters are, are correct, um, there are options for data export, for remote data interfacing um, on a on a telnet level, on an on an API level via the Ethernet connection that we have. So many things, maybe to talk in person, to talk one to one uh, about the project specific requirements of everybody. Um, I shall rather go back to my slides now which would be this. And um, well, I've talked about fibers, I've talked about sensing cables, and maybe it's uh, interesting what actually these exact means. So the optic fiber, it's, it's a delicate thing. It's a, it's a glass element, which is thin as a human hair and which transmits light data. And as we just saw, is also capable of doing sensing. You don't want to bring that onto a construction site as it is. Uh, no need to worry about it because um, we're in the, I would say, lucky position that after all these years, the industry provides a huge variety of dedicated fiber optic sensing cables. So the cable is what is around the fiber or which has the fiber inside and is there uh, mostly uh, to fulfill, fulfill two tasks. Um, one task is to protect the fiber from the outside world. The other one is to make it still sensitive to what is happening in the outside world. So it sounds like 
a contradiction and it somehow is because um, of course throughout the whole Atlantic and all over the land um, there are fiber optic cables for telecommunications. So these only perform one task and that's pro protect the fiber. So the fibers are in there loosely, they are well protected. If you use them for sensing, for strain sensing, the fiber will just not feel what's going on inside. So a dedicated sensing cable is in a very substantial part of any monitoring uh, project. So it needs to be taken, uh, selected with care. As I said, many of them are available. Metallic, non-metallic, metallic would mean that there's a, that there's a stainless steel tube in the middle, which contains the fiber. And then the fiber is of course, tightly glued to it. That would be like a stainless steel fiber here, armoring, no armorings. Um, different cross section, they're also non-metallic, just polymer based uh, cable designs, um, flat designs to be glued on surfaces and so on and so forth. That's for strain sensing cables. Um, interesting thing about the technology is that it always measures temperature and strain at the same time. So for temperature sensing, of course, we know, need the uh, entire opposite, which would be um, a temperature sensing cable, which is not a tight bucket, but a loose tube one. That means that for a temperature sensing cable, you just want all the mechanic deformations going on outside not to be transferred into your optical fiber. So uh, a good temperature sensing cable shall have a loose tube, the fiber being freely and with some extra lengths. So if the cable is being stretched, then the fiber can relax, but not being strained. Again, metallic designs, non-metallic designs, armored um, like that one and so on. Um, so fiber optic sensing offers you the opportunity to, to, to uh, design your project um, including existing components, existing cables, fiber optic connectors are out there in the market. These are actually field proven, even from telecom, various types of fiber connectors, um, cleaning material and all that. So um, not so much time needed to really get into the matter. Um, and then of course a project would be ready to go on the instrument level and cable side. However, as I said, um, components that form a successful um, monitoring projects are the integrated technology, are the sensing cable. And with that, you get a signal trace, strain and temperature on your screen. A true project is much more than that. That is for sure, um, especially geotechnical and structural projects, which, uh, which require vast knowledge about what's going on beyond the sensing cables. So the signal trace reflects strain coming from the optical fiber, deformation coming from the coating and the cable. And from there, the, all the knowledge about the geotechnical ongoings um, start. So therefore, I would say, the third integral component of a successful monitoring project is ex exactly that. The knowledge about uh, suitable integration, uh, project planning, data analysis, data interpretation. That is where an, a, a successful monitoring project a dedicated system integrator or specialized engineering company would be absolutely required. That is where I'm happy that we have um, Christoph Monsberger from um, ACI Monitoring um, here on our show. And also that's the moment where I would like to hand over to you, Christoph. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Niels, for your introducing words. And good afternoon, everybody from Graz in Austria. My name is Christoph Monsberger. I'm the co-CEO of ACI Monitoring. ACI Monitoring is a spin-off company of Graz University of Technology and was founded in April 2021 to provide innovative sensing solutions for civil infrastructure, but with a special focus on distributed fiber optic sensing. So our target is to design, to develop, and to install and operate DFOS monitoring systems for civil infrastructure. 
to finally detect, localize, and identify potential damages along civil infrastructure at the earliest possible moment. Despite our young history or the young history of our company, we can already look back on a wide range of applications, in my opinion. So these applications range from soil mechanics applications, as you can see on the left-hand side, for example, reinforced earth structures, pile monitoring or retaining wall monitoring to pipeline monitoring and structural engineering applications like bridges. Our space special focus in recent years was, however, tunnel monitoring. There has been a tunnel monitoring. So what, what's the conventional way to provide tunnel monitoring? It is state of the art to, do, uh, to provide genetic methods in that tunnel, e.g. by total station measurement or laser scanning to measure displacements of points along the surface of the object or to integrate geotechnical sensors like strain gauges or extensometers to get information from the inside of the structure. For tunnels already constructed, so tunnels under operation, also mobile mapping platforms or visual inspections are used to assess the structural integrity. However, these technologies have some drawbacks, I want to say. Either they require a visual line of sight between the measurement device, for instance, the total station and the tunnel surface, or they do not allow autonomous measurements without any impact on the structure's operability, which is always related to tunnel closures during operations or interferences with the tunnel construction works, or they do not enable distributed measurements with an adequate spatial resolutions from the inside of the structure. And from this, you can see that the distributed fiber optic sensing sensing can for sure provide advantages and benefits for tunnel monitoring. Since the sensing cable can be directly integrated into the tunnel lining or attached to the lining surface. This enables distributed measurements from the inside of the object without any physical access to the tunnel itself. And the sensing unit can be placed kilometers away, which means outside of the tunnel and no power supply is needed directly at the measurement locations. So some of you might have already considered to use distributed fiber optics for his or her monitoring approach. But there are still some open questions and issues what I get involved with. And that's, for instance, some of you might be wondering about the fragility of the optical sensing fibers or, or the optical sensing cables. And are they able to withstand harsh environment in a tunnel? What about appropriate installation techniques and how can we fit the installation of the monitoring or the installation of the distributed fiber optic sensing system to the construction works. And finally, what about the monitoring costs? Because there are always stories about the initial costs of the sensing unit itself and th that these costs are quite high compared to conventional sensing. And that's basically the questions and issues I want to address with my contribution to today's webinar. So as I mentioned before, we already realized or get involved into projects with numerous partners all over the world in tunnel monitoring. These applications range from conventional tunnel shotcrete cross sections to cast in place inner linings, shotcrete shaft linings, as well as designs for precast tunnel lining segments and existing tunnel lining structures. The time in today's webinar is definitely limited. And for that reason, I just want to present or to demonstrate to you what's really important or what you can get out of a distributed fiber optic sensing system in tunneling, I want to present to you two specific applications which we already realized. And the first one is a combined approach of shot -treat tunnel cross sections and inner tunnel links. This approach was realized at the so-called Tunnel Rudersdorf. Tunnel Rudersdorf is a highway tunnel in the eastern part of Austria and the construction works there faced several complex geological and hydrogeological conditions with loose rock materials like sand, gravel, or clay. In addition, the construction company or the owner of the structure has or had uh, legal constraints for the construction itself, since the excavation material must be directly deposited on site above the tunnel road. And this increased the initial level covering height here of about six meters to in total 33 meters after the tunnel was excavated. And I think all of you know and can see that this implicates huge additional stresses 
for the tunnel lining itself. And basically, for that reason, the tunnel owner Aspinap, so the Austrian Highway Agency, decided to go for an extended monitoring approach, which also includes distributed fiber optic sensing. And ACI monitoring was instructed to design an extensive sensing network along the inner and outer tunnel lining of the tunnel, including 23 measurement cross sections along both linings, as well as 200 meters in longitudinal direction of the tunnel. All the cables were assembled together and collected at a measurement container above the tunnel route. So we used supply fibers from the inside of the tunnel to the container and measurements could be performed autonomously without any, any physical access to the tunnel itself. As already mentioned by Niels before, the output of a distributed fiber of the sensing system or strain sensing system are just the values itself. So we get, for instance, strain change over time or the total strain magnitude or the shape along the cross section. However, the tunnel system reacts to causative forces, which are, for instance, in our case, bulk material loads from the top of the tunnel, tunnel construction works, formal loads, and so forth. So this system from the causative forces over the tunnel system to the distributed fiber optic strain values must be well understood to draw the right conclusion about the tunnel behavior. And for that, we perform continuous readings every 60 minutes using a fibrostereo sensing unit during the construction works. The data, were, uh, the data was autonomously evaluated without any user action, interaction, and automatically transferred to the geotechnical engineer on site, who could decide based on the data if the current supporting methods are sufficient or further stabilization uh, actions are needed to stabilize the tunnel lining. In addition, warning mails were sent out if predefined values are exceeded in order to trigger further analysis of the data. The question is now, how can such a visualization and the data transfer to the chief technical engineer can look like? And for this, we can provide our own ACI software tools. For instance, the ACI Analyzer, an online visualization tool for visualization of distributed fiber optic monitoring data. With this, you can, for instance, display the strain distribution along the cross section, as you can see here on the left-hand side, or even a time series of selected points along the cross section or in longitudinal direction. In addition, we can also provide the ACI monitor, a configuration and initialization system for different selected DFOS interrogation units. The second project I want to present to you today is dealing with precast tunnel lining segments. Precast tunnel lining segments are generally used when the tunnel is excavating, excavated using a tunnel boring machine. The tunnel boring machine uh, sets up a ring, which consists of six to eight segments to uh, basically support the excavation. Conventionally, such segments are monitored using strain gauges, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. These are just local sensors indicated with red dots along the reinforcement. And based on this sketch of the reinforcement, you can see that distributed fiber optic sensors can provide a huge advantage since one continuous sensing cable can be installed along, along the individual segments. And through the guiding of the fiber optic sensing cable, a complete coverage of the, of the segment can be built. So in total, we can provide with a fiber optic monitoring system, we can provide a complete coverage of the whole segments instead of just three or six or a number of points actually along the line using point-wise strain gauges. And I think the advantage of using fiber optics for such an application is quite easy to demonstrate on, uh, by means of two pictures I want to present to you on the next slide. On the left-hand side, you can see an instrumentation using conventional strain gauges. Six monitoring points along one lining and just the leading cables to realize this monitoring. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see an installation of a fiber optic monitor of a distributed fiber optic monitoring system. So a very thin blue cable, individually guided along the reinforcement, and finally realizes 200 to 7,000 measurement points, depending on the on the DFOS principle. So actually, you can draw your conclusions basically on your own, but you can see that there might be a huge benefit for distributed fiber optic sensing in such a situation. In the tunnel, as I said in advance, 
the individual segments are set together to a ring system and also the fiber optic monitoring system or the, the individual segments within the within the within the within the tunnel can be basically connected to one continuous sensing ring using here connectors as shown by Niels before. The measurement unit, for instance, the fiber stereo wires can be placed behind the tunnel boring machine or even outside of the tunnel. The measurement cross sections are basically connected together using supply cables or can be also integrated into the fiber optic tunnel network so that no physical access is needed after the installation. Let us now take a look on some exemplary results of such an instrumentation. You can see here on the right hand side, basically, the strain distribution along the outer lining, so in dark red, and along the inner lining, in the brighter red, along one specific measurement cross section. And what we can get of the data is basically, firstly, that we can, we can provide continuous measurements along the entire cross section without any gaps. And this with a spatial resolution of some, some centimeters, even in the harsh environment inside the tunnel. What's also important for us to see is that even if the segments, or even if there is no continuous loop, so that's quite individual segments, but we can see that the transitions in between the segments are quite continuous. That's also a plausibility check for our monitoring. And there is a correlation in between the outer reinforcement layer and the, in, in the, uh, and the inner reinforcement layer, the split areas. For example, here at the ground area or at the bench inward section. And these effects or this, these deviations are basically related to uh, curvature effects of the tunnel lining ring. And the data can then be used for further analysis, for instance, to determine cutting forces and finally the utilization of the tunnel lining secondary. In addition to the overall assessment of the structure, distributed fiber optic sensors can be also used to detect local distortions along the structure. What you can see here in the middle of the screen is basically the deformation or the, the strain sensing signal along one individual segment with a sensing cable length of about 50 meter over time. And what we can see is one specific strain change at about midnight of the specific day, highlighted here in red. And this immediate change in strain at this specific location can be related to a concrete spelling, a concrete spelling inside the tunnel of about 25 centimeters, which occurred during the further construction process. And I think this local damage can only be captured with an in-situ technology like fiber, distributed fiber optic sensing, or maybe with laser scanning, but this either would require a direct access to the tunnel. So there is also a huge advantage, advantage of distributed fiber optic sensing. Last but not least, I promised you to present or, or to talk about the monitoring costs for distributed fiber optic sensing in comparison to points. And I think it definitely came out of today's presentation that if you have a small scale project with just a limited number of sensing points, just go ahead. I can just recommend to you to use point-wise sensing, for instance, strain gauges or similar. However, if you have a larger project in mind, the higher initial costs, as you can see here on the left hand side, for distributed fiber optic sensors can more or less quickly turn into cost efficiency if you want to have a network extension and a more holistic approach to monitor your structure. So if you want to have a more overall information, so a distributed information over the entire structure, you might have significant economic advantages for monitoring using distributed fiber optic sensors. I want to conclude my today's webinar contribution with the three reasons for you to include fiber optics into your tunnel monitoring approach. Firstly, distributed fiber optic sensing can provide continuous and distributed information along the entire structure. So information along the entire structure without any gaps in between sensing points. And for this, no visual line of sight is required. So monitoring is also possible behind of constructional or operational equipment. And last but not least, no physical access, no physical human access to the tunnel is needed. So sensing can be performed, distributed without any interference with the construction works or the regular operation. Just keep in mind, if you want to use, in general, a sensing concept for your project, 
to include an appropriate sensing design at the earliest possible stage of the project. It's always important that it's included at the earliest possible moment. For fiber optic sensors in general, try to use reliable fiber optic components, for instance, the sensing unit or the sensing cable. And finally, use robust intuitive installation techniques that fit to the construction process and do not limit or restrict the construction itself. So that's it, basically. I want to thank you for your attention and your attendance and want now to hand back to our webinar moderator, Jane. Christoph, thanks. That was fantastic. And thank you, Nils, as well. Well, having listened to all that, and thank you for, to our participants whose questions are rolling in, but is it possible to install the systems in an absence of mains electricity power? Can permanent installations run from solar with battery backup power? Now, I know, Christoph, that this is something that you spent some time looking at recently. That's a, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, we are working on this, I think, almost a year now. It's, and this this may be, might be the reason why I'm smiling now. Um, actually, yes, it's possible. Um, we have to think about continuous readings and so on. And you might have to replace the battery every month or similar. Uh, it might be not sufficient to have continuous readings with just a, a battery in the solar panel because of the, the, the power needed by the system. But actually, it's definitely possible. And we are currently working in it. We have some, some projects in mind where to use just solar panels, uh, turning the instrument on, I do not know, once, once every six hours or similar to get one reading. And that's definitely possible. Uh, but as I said, it depends on the on the measurement frequency and what you what do you want to get out of basically of the data. Thank well, you, Chris. Maybe adding on to that on the technical side. Um, well, the interrogated unit itself, as we said, we designed it for low power consumption. So with the 30 watts, you get a you get a long way, uh, even with solar power. Of course, there has to be taken into account that an external computer would be probably be with it on site, but well, these days there are pulses, power saving, field applicable rack PCs. We are happy to help you specify that. Christoph shared his experience on that. So I think, I think there are many ways to, to get into that solution. One remark from my side chain, sorry. It always depends also on the, on the output of the solar panel. For sure, if you have the the infrastructure to get a really huge solar panel there, we can also provide a continuous, uh, continuous monitoring system there. That, that's no problem at all. So it depends on, on, the, on the boundary conditions of the construction site in the end. Right, and a quick question. I think this one goes to, to Nils. Um, Nils, can you, can you measure at a frequency of at a greater frequency than every 60 minutes? Yes, well, I, I think again, this, this uh, question uh, shall be answered on the two levels. Uh, let me start on the, on the instrumentation side. Um, yes, the, um, the readout frequency um, depends on the fiber length, on the spatial resolution, on the strain range you're covering. So all these, these um, measurement parameters um, are interchangeable so you can always like sacrifice um, spatial resolution to gain measurement time and these things basically we're in the below a minute range for a reading for fiber length of a few hundred meters and beyond kilometers we go into the few minutes range of, with 25 kilometers here well a bit beyond that still depends um, so Allow me to combine that with the other question that's right there in the chat, uh, chat also from, from Derek. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Whether it, it, it picks up external impact. And I, I think these are related because technology wise, this is a static reading. So I'm talking about minutes here. That means um, it's not dynamic, doesn't pick vibrations, which of course is a limitation, but it's also a big benefit because it is exactly that. What do you say? It's insensitive sensitive to impact, to noise on the construction site, to, um, to vibration on the bridge or in the tunnel or wherever. So 
It's mostly, well, practically entirely decoupled from that, so that it's a, it's a static. There are, vibra um, they are vibration sensitive dynamic um, fiber optic sensing technologies, but this is static. And that not only means that it's insensitive to, to vibrations impacts, it's also, it also means um, that it's extremely long term stable. So that means that you plug in, take your baseline, you come back one hour later and your baseline is still valid, can back, come back a day, a week, a month, a year later. We have been doing that, that we go onto a site every three months and the baseline reading is just stable. That's at least in the five. I mean, there's, there's another question um, about the, the coupling between the, the cable and um, and the surrounding, but on the fiber, it's long-term stable. So that, that's what it is. Static measurement, minutes of readout frequency, um, and long-term stability. I'd like to give over to Christoph, but because on the measurement frequency in the field, I think uh, you might want to add some practical considerations. The one thing I have to highlight here, it always depends also on the strain range, what you expect, and on the temperature range you expect, more on the strain range, to be honest. If you expect a huge strain range, so not, not in the absolute strain value, it depends just on the strain range from the lowest level of strain to the highest level. You have to basically to capture all the measurement frequencies. And for sure, the, the, the larger the, the frequency window basically is for the measure, measurement, uh, the, the higher or the, the, the higher uh, or the longer the measurement will last. I think that, that's the thing I have to add. Christoph, can I, can I follow that? Um, your answer there with um, how many interrogators are used? I guess he's talking per project. Um, yeah, actually, normally we use just per, 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 per site. You normally it depends on the project size, definitely. Uh, but for the project uh, I showed to you in advance, uh, with the 23 cross section inside the tunnel and about 200 meters in longitudinal direction, there was just one interrogator used. We used it with the optical switch. Um, in total, we had there four sensing loops, so uh, two sensing loops per tunnel, so one for the inner and one for the outer lining, and that definitely worked with all the attenuations and so on. I might combine this also with another question: um, What about the what about the effects of having a large number of slices? You know, um, sure. The higher the attenuation is along your fiber optic sensing loop. The, the higher the, the signal to noise ratio gets over time. It's a quite a usual thing. So it's always a trade off in having a long range of sensing cable and uh, to provide the installation along a long structure um, and uh, having a high measurement precision. But finally, it depends on, on the engineering company or the engineers on site. Who does the splicing works? Uh, what about connectors? Can we avoid connectors and put in some splice instead of this? Is, is there a possibility to go inside or to go to the to the splicing point and perform a splice instead of a connector? Um, and yeah, that, as I said, and I hope I pointed this out in my presentation, it always depends on the design at the end. And if the design is more or less appropriate for the applications, you will get out useful data. We've also got a question on convergence monitoring. What is the accuracy that can be reached in terms of displacement calculation from strain measurements? Um, Christoph, would you like to would you like to take that one? A great question. Um, it depends. It depends on the project. So actually, you know, calculating displacements out of strain measurements is always, or, or the accuracy always depends on the boundary condition. You have to transfer the strain of the curvature. This can be done by different ways, either by installing different layers along an object or by, by doing some modeling work. But finally, you get the curvature values and you have to, provide, uh, have to determine a curvature, a uh, double integration of the curvature. And yeah, you can do this by using kilometers, for instance, the horizontal or vertical kilometers. Um, there you have to do a single integration, just as a sum up, but for, for curvature values and strain values, um, you have to always to do a double integration and errors in the, in the fiber optic strain sensing approach uh, have not only a linear effect on the, on the displacement, 
it's more or less uh, over two effect and that definitely influences the displacement values and to conclude the question it always depends on the project it depends on the sensing length of the displacement sensing and finally uh, it depends on the stability of your supporting points of the boundary conditions so that's a, a question which can not, cannot be answered in, in general um, but yeah for for let me do an assumption for sensing length of about 50 meters using a fibrostero device in two layers you can definitely uh, achieve an accuracy for the displacement value if this installation is appropriately done in the in the centimeter to millimeter range it depends to measure only strain you need to subtract the effect of the temperature two cables or one cable what are your thoughts Niels do you want to answer that Yes, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that's that's a very important and also a rather uh, classic question. So thank you for that. Sure. It's, um, well, there are approaches to do in brittle sensing to do it all within one fiber. The thing is that for ourselves, it has proven the practical approach to go like the safe road, take two fibers, one being tight buffered, one being um, loose tube. Question whether this shall be in one cable or two. Um, well, probably we could talk about that for hours. Uh, conventionally, we have always said use two cables because two cables that are de dedicated to strain temperature are in most designs cheaper than a combined cable, easier to handle, and also more reliable on the geometry side. However, there is a lot of movement on the cable production in the cable production industry. So um, maybe I would take that with a bit more care these days. Important thing is two fibers is the approach that we're going for. Our software allows for, um, for automatic separation. This is extremely easy math of course it's uh just the two equations that need to be uh, put together there you have one um sensing trace which is strain and temperature together and the other one that is supposedly if everything goes well uh and the, the design is good temperature only um so our software does that but we also deliver the data and help and have some documentation on how to do that on our own so that works well um Again, let me hand over to Christoph with some practical implications of that. And again, not really huge additionals here. Uh, the only thing uh, I think we have to note here is that all integrators have to keep in mind that the geometrical quantity of the cable. So if you now use a screen sensing cable in the one length and the, the, the basically the, 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 the inbound with the with the temperature sensing fiber, keep in mind that there might be slightly different lengths just from the guiding of the cable, and this should be all taken into account for the for the temperature compensation. Finally, I think there is also this question. I think it goes more in the direction maybe using or combining different interrogation principles. Maybe Brillen and Raman. That can be also a case for this one um, used by different companies or used in different projects all over the world. Um, in my opinion, we're also talking about cost efficiency. And if there is a way to realize temperature compensation with a brilliant system, so installing two cables or even one cable with a temperature sensing fiber and a strain sensing fiber inside, there can be definitely a cost efficiency by using just a brilliant device instead of using a Raman and a brilliant device. That's my opinion on this topic, but there's that there are definitely different ways to analyze this one. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks, thanks both Niels and, and Christoph for their answers to that. I think we've got time for two more questions. Um, so the first one is, uh, and this one I think goes, goes to Christoph. Do you help in design of placement of the sensor? Yeah, that's a thing you can definitely do. Especially in tunneling, I think that we have now a huge experience uh, in the sense of placement. What you then get out of the data, that's also a really critical thing, because if you install it, for instance, if you assume a concrete uh, concrete beam and you install it next to the neutral axis of the sensor, there might be the chance you can that you cannot get out anything of the data from the strain sensing. And yeah, that's definitely a thing which always have to be considered for a project. And yeah. 
we can basically provide on the one hand the sensor design and the monitoring concept of all, as I said in advance, how many sensors, how many splices, how many connectors, but we can also provide the installation and finally the monitoring with the, with the software and so on. So that's definitely a thing which we can offer. I see that the interrogator has two sensor connectors. What happens when there are multiple sensing cables, each with a different termination end connector? Can the measuring be done by the interrogator, or the sensing device? Will this have an impact on the signal quality? Well, first of all, something that I should have mentioned earlier, it is true. The interrogator unit is designed for one sensing loop, but that's a modular philosophy that we're going here. The first, or well, one of the most important accessories to that is a fiber optic switch that can um, that allows to measure uh, a, a number of, of, of more than just one uh, sensing loop in series. So they are, are connected in parallel fiber optic sensing switch. It is a 19 inch rack unit, one just one rack unit high as well comes on top or below the, the unit is connected, integrated into the software. You just configure your channels and each channel is one sensing loop. We have that with two channels, four channels, eight channels, 12, 16, 32. Then it gets a bit uh, more challenging, but e even more than 32 channels um, are possible. On the different um, terminations and, and sensor connectors, so you can mix even with one channel switch, you can make mix single ended and double ended uh, measurements. So you configure in the, in the in software, you have like your eight channels and Number five is broken, so you have only on number five, um, you have a single in a measurement. Um, you will need to specify the connector, connector type. Um, but then again, as I said, these connector types that we provide, they are even compatible. So oh, let me show that. Even this one goes in here, this one goes in here. And so they even would mate. Um, this is for the FC and E2000 connectors. Of course, there is a, a full zoo of telecom type um, fiber optic connectors. They are not all compatible, uh, but there are uh, patch cuts for everybody. So having said that, maybe just going into some of the other questions, what happens if we chain up adapters and splices and yet another connector? Do we lose sensitivity? Well, yes. But if the connectors are clean and if the splices are okay or good, um, the system copes with an impressive number of these. So splices, you can easily go with a with a number of, of five, ten, even more splices if they are if if they are done to to normal industry standards. Um, connectors, each connector has some 0. Point something dB. Uh, if they are clean, um, maybe. Putting it down to the to, to, to the appeal, don't be afraid of that. It's you, you can make a lot of work. The system is designed for reality, robust measurements, even under the that kind of, of conditions. So basically, yes, it's possible. Thank you, Nils. Thanks very much for that. There was one question that I think hmm, I if I make the rules, then I guess I'm allowed to break them. Just at risk of running over the hour. Um, a question, if the cables aren't embedded in concrete, could they be protected in another way, e.g. an armor? I assume that if the cable is broken, it stops working over the full length of the system or just where the break is. I think that's a, that's a question that we're asked a lot. Um, who would like to take that first? I think that that's definitely a question for me and, and yeah, um, a very good one and a question which is always asked by different clients. Um, first of all, yes, you're completely right. If you have a breakage, you cannot operate with the BOFDA, but there's still a way with lower accuracy and lower precision using the BOFDR. There's one chance. Um, if we provide our, so our, our, our company provides the design. We always have some kind of backup options if there's really a damage of a cable. Anyhow, you can also protect the lead cables. There are 
telecommunication cables or similar, which provides you with armoring and so on, so that also the lead cables are really protected. We can additionally protect them with conduits. That, that's quite a normal way to do it on the construction site. And as I said, there are telecommunication cables especially developed that can also, um, how to say, it, they can also withstand really, really harsh impacts from construction machinery and so on. So that's definitely not a problem. It only depends on the design finally. Thank you. Thanks for that, Christoph. Nils, do you have any anything to add to that? Um, well, that's that's certainly a, uh, a practical thing where we only can learn from um, the integrating uh, companies which well, which decide to work with instrumentation. So I'm always happy to hear about these things. Um, I think also, well, now there's only two questions left. <laughs> so I think at least the first one also has partly been answered by, by Christoph, maybe if I may make a comment on that, the question is what about the integration in the field? The transfer function depends also on the tightness of the cable with the field. And that is exactly, um, I think, where this experience comes in. Um, I'd like to hand over that to Christoph as well. I'm afraid I don't quite get the other one, which is what the economic, economic sensing length is but maybe if I might may just guess um, one important thing about this technology is that the sensing length the trace goes from the connector to the connector so uh, you plug in and you measure the entire fiber from zero meters to where it goes into the uh, interrogator uh, unit again or to the fiber end in case of single end monitoring so um, there are technologies which need like lead fiber and other things. There is no minimum fiber length, length either. Um, so you can plug in one meter if it makes sense uh, in, in, in that case. Um, so right, you plug in, you get the whole fiber from beginning to end, no matter how long it is with the limitations up to 25 or 50 kilometers, it depends. Um, I hope I got that right. Um, this question was more in my direction. So I presented some kind of economic trends, uh, economic for the cost efficiency between point-wise and distributed sensing. And yeah, that's also a thing that it cannot be commented or analyzed in general. Okay, you can you can have standard parameters to answer this question. That's definitely possible. But in the end, you have to ask basically the question. Um, what sensing technology do you want to use? Do you want to use a strain sensing technology? Maybe you can also use tilt sensors if you use point by sensors and so on and so forth. It is wireless, is it, is it on wire and so on? So that, that cannot be un answered in general, I think, uh, this question. Where is the exact economic value to use a distributed technology instead of a point by technology? Um, it depends on the project. And yeah, that's a thing we can definitely analyze for every client is it useful to use fiber optics or distributed fiber optics instead of a point-wise technology? And the second question about, about the integration in the field, the strain transfer function depends also uh, of the tightness of the cable with the field. Not 100% correct, but anyhow, um, yeah, that's definitely a thing. So what about the long-term stability? I think on the one hand, we have the distributed fiber optic sensing unit which I think is, is really long time stable. So we do not have to think about the long term stability of, of the fiber optic sensing unit itself, but you are completely right about the cable. So we have to keep in mind that maybe if this is really a long term project, which should last for at least 50 to 100 years, we have to think about maybe uh, some kind of a reference length in the field uh, to be sure that the cable is not altering at all. Altering at all. So maybe, maybe that, that's a thing which must be considered for a project. But as I said, it depends on, on the project dimension, on the project length and so on. So um, yeah, but what we are basically doing um, with selected sensing cable or sensing cable we have used in the field up to now, that we have some kind of reference lens where the cables are uh, more or less strained or stressed to a certain level and they keep over time on this level and we are measuring them every three months or every year or similar. To, to see what about what about the process of the cable itself. And what we are also doing is that we embedded some, some selected fibers inside concrete to see if there are any any 
any processes over time uh, which are acting on the cable list. That's the things we are doing. This, this bit, our installations, just to be sure that the quality is not, that the system is not losing a quality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Christoph. Thank you to our participants. We have run just over the hour. I apologize for that. Thank you very much for participating. We hope we've answered our objectives, giving you the three reasons to use or to consider using fiber optic sensing in your next project. The joy of this is these two wonderful people are available to talk to. Uh, they can be contacted. You have their emails. We'll send a follow-up email to everyone. Uh, you can re-watch the recording um, and, of course, get in touch uh, on their websites directly. Um, they're very approachable people. And I think everybody in both companies is, is very approachable. So don't hesitate to keep the questions coming in and to talk to them uh, to get the best advice on what system would be right for your project. Thank you very much again for your participation and I wish you an excellent rest of the afternoon. Thank you.